We're covering a lot in this video, so feel free to skip around. The timestamps are in the description. Whether you're new or a veteran player, you should be able to get something out of this video. The information is current and was collected after the economy update. We're also including any relevant information in the upcoming 2.3 patch, so this is about as current as current can be. Believe it or not, your gear is actually the least important part of your farming setup. Game knowledge, knowing where to farm, farming techniques, and using the proper tools make up the other 95% of your success. Essentially, all you need to worry about is hitting 50 encumbrance and 30 survival while using whatever stats you have left over to get 10 agility for the cheaper sprint and as much vitality and grit as you can afford. You'll want to prioritize getting 20 vitality if you're setting out to farm in the volcano or the frozen north. Seriously, don't overthink this part. I wouldn't even advise you to use buffs in most circumstances, and we'll, we'll talk about that later. Just put on your best encumbrance gear and bring the appropriate tools and repair kits. Best in slot legendary gear with specific stat increases is generally not worth the time required to farm it and it makes very little actual difference. The only novelty items worth farming for your farm build would be bearer packs and specific tools that we're going to talk about later, but even the bearer packs are not at all necessary. With the increased stack sizes for most items, it's also perfectly viable for shorter farming runs to stay fully in a combat spec and have a bearer thrall or your horse carry most of your farm. This is especially useful on servers where you can expect to be attacked while you're out, or generally on the Isle of Sipta due to a smaller size encouraging a lot more player encounters. I would still recommend having at least 30 survival so you don't waste any oils of balance you use and you reduce the amount of repair kits you need and generally the faster you farm the safer you are typically. But if the server you're on is really active and you genuinely don't feel that you can afford to dump 30 points into survival then that's perfectly understandable, but just try to grab it when you can. A star metal is your budget choice. A standard star metal run will give you enough to craft and maintain your tools for ages. Star metal with an advanced tool upgrade kit is your bare minimum for end game farming. Obsidian tools are unlocked in the Volcano Dungeon here and are crafted using composite obsidian which can only be obtained at the Volcanic Forge. You get it by placing 10 obsidian and 1 steel bar into the Volcanic Furnace and leaving it to smelt. It might seem like it's more trouble than it's worth, but steel is pretty cheap and once you've got a decent supply of composite obsidian you're set for a while because you can repair these with master repair kits. I highly encourage you to use these if you're not using black blood. In Sipta, you can obtain the recipe for Eldarium tools at the Lay Shrine of the Birdmen and craft them using Eldarium bars. You'll get those bars from smelting the unrefined Eldarium that you get from vaults. Their gathering rate is on par with Black Blood tools and Obsidian, so they're going to be your Sipta replacement for Obsidian tools. The tools with the highest farming potential would be Black Blood, though. You obtain these from killing this boss here in the Exiled Lands, or this bird here on the Isle of Sipta. Their harvesting power is the same as Obsidian, but they'll give you a plus 5 boost to your survival when equipped and the real value lies in their durability, which opens up the ability to efficiently use Oils of Bounty, so let's cover that real quick. The Oil of Bounty recipe is unlocked from the same guy that gives you the map room recipe, or in Sipta, you get it from Vault Chest. Once you have the recipe, you craft the Oils of Bounty at home and you apply them to your tools, which will give them a substantial increase to their farm rate. Just to stress the point, you cannot apply Oils of Bounty to a tool that already has any other kit applied to it, so you have to choose whether you're using Oils or not. It will not stack or be usable with a tool upgrade kit, it's one or the other. After applying the oil, a timer appears on the tool. When you have the tool equipped, that timer is going to tick down, and when it hits zero, the oil will expire and your tool durability will be reduced to one. It's not going to break the tool, so you can repair it and then apply a new oil to it and just continue farming. Because the timer only ticks down when the item is equipped, and not while the item is in your inventory, you can prolong its use by unequipping your tool as soon as you've finished farming a node, and while traveling between resources. For skinning knives especially, learning to animation cancel the minute the body is harvested allows you to use only a second or two on each harvest, which considerably prolongs the duration of your oil of bounty. The duration of the oil of bounty depends on the base durability of the tool that you apply it to. Because black blood tools are legendary tools, they have considerably higher durabilities, which means that their oil duration is considerably longer as well. You can apply oils of bounty to lower quality tools, but because their duration is so short, you're increasing the amount of oil you have to farm to a point where it no longer makes sense. To further increase your farm on the Isle of Sipta, the Sigil of the Gremlin will give you a persistent buff to your farming rate while it's active. You obtain it from this dungeon here. It's worth picking up if you're playing on Sipta. It's only about a 5-10% to difference in farming or so, but that adds up over time. With that, let's move to materials. 
What you're looking for with these bulk resources is tight, compact node placement and decent volume. Make sure you know more than a few good spots for iron since the better spots like the silver mine and God's Claw Passage can be very high traffic and having to fight people off while you're farming is bad for efficiency. Truthfully, there's not a biome in the game that doesn't have some kind of access to good iron, so farm one that works with your farm route and one that you can farm safely. If you're using Oils of Bounty, which I'll refer to as Oils from now on, the tightest iron placement is inside the silver mine, which means you can mine a lot more at a reduced cost to your oil durability. We're not going to go over every single spot, but just enough to give you a few options depending on where you live. For Sipta, lots of the farming advice is going to be more or less identical. The resources are really nicely spread out, so if you need anything, chances are it's around a dungeon or at the center of the map. But here's a few iron spots beyond that, just so you have an idea. Really, the entire map is covered with it, so just pay attention when you travel. Stone is another basic resource that often gets overlooked. You need it for improved stations via hardened brick, siege buildings, explosive jars, boulders, and a lot of other PvP applications. So farming this efficiently is just as important as any other resource. As with iron, make sure you're grabbing nodes that are heavily overlapped. Don't waste your time farming sporadic rocks that require you to run from one node to the other. Just grab the tightly packed nodes as you farm other materials. The volcano, Noob River, the desert, there's a lot of really great rock outcrops everywhere on the map. Just discern between the ones that are worth farming and the ones that are worth skipping. And I'll say it here just so that we're all on the same page, you should never be building with hardened brick on PvP servers. It just isn't worth the time investment. You should be farming stone exclusively for its other applications. Wood is fairly basic and simple, so we'll be quick. The only tool you should ever use is a pickaxe, and I've collected the data on this. Whether it's resin, bark, wood, branches, the pickaxe is going to give you your best yields. And in case you're wondering, a pickaxe is going to give you just as much wood as a hatchet while also giving you all of the extra byproducts, so there's actually no situation where a hatchet would ever be used. Keep in mind that excess wood can be turned into bark, so not only does the pickaxe outclass the hatchet, but it also outclasses the pick, in that it'll give you more bark outright, and then the extra wood that it gives you can be turned into even more bark. As with every resource, you're going to want to farm in areas where the trees are tightly packed together. In the exiled lands, the forests around the dead mounds are probably the best in the game for this, as well as some areas in the frozen north. In Sipta, there's no one spot that is any more dense than any other, so for the most part they're evenly spread out, just farm wherever it's safe to. Specifically when trying to produce insulated wood, don't worry about about manually farming dry wood. Place wood in a dryer along with bark at a ratio of two bark for every piece of wood. When it's done crafting, it's gonna give you two dry wood and one resin each time, so eventually you're gonna wind up with a surplus of dry wood. Focus on farming the resin and the bark portion of that, because those are your bottlenecks. Deforesting an area specifically to get resin and bark for insulated wood is actually a great way to speed up the process, but if you just wanna quickly farm bark and let it craft overnight, that works too. There's no major trick for bark, you just use a pick on dead trees, so make sure you go to a location with a lot of them. When you're gathering wood and resin, you can turn the excess wood into bark by using upgraded carpenter's benches. You've got two poisons in this game, Reaper Poison and Scorpion Queen Poison. In Exiled Lands, Scorpion Queen Poison is only obtained from the glands of the Scorpion Queen in the Silver Mines. Reaper Poison is crafted from glands harvested from locusts found in these areas. The best tool to use is a pick. I've sometimes gotten higher yields of glands using a cleaver as well, but it seems like it's one of those sporadic resources that can fluctuate a lot. And a pick is also going to give you ichor, and you should be multi-farming whenever you can.
The lizard and spider bosses in the vaults of Sipta also drop venom sacs when harvested. Opening them will give you a large assortment of different poisons and poisonous glands. I intentionally wrote very little for this part of the script because I hate horses, but the simple truth of it is that if you don't have one, you're at a disadvantage, so stock up and keep a few on standby. Named alchemists come with a recipe that allows you to craft 5 oil at the cost of 1 ichor and 1 bark. After the 2.3 patch, tier 3 alchemists will also have this recipe. This is the best way to obtain oil in bulk. You can, however, put fish into a fluid press to make oil. Fish traps have to be filled with bait before they produce fish. Craft some compost and put it into a compost heap. Grubs will begin to spawn naturally up to a stack of 50 per box. So build as many compost heaps as you're comfy with and use the grubs to bait your fish traps. Spiders, locusts, komodos, scorpions, salamanders, and slugs will all give you ichor when harvested. Don't farm gold to make alchemical base. We'll get into that in the next section, but I hesitantly included gold because you could make the case that purchasing elephant hides from the merchants can be safer than farming the savanna or in the middle of the map in Sipta, given that elephants currently have absurd health and armor. In Sipta, there's also a merchant that sells cat pets, and given that those are super viable for PvP, it's not a bad idea to swing over there with a few thousand gold coins and just buy 30 of them instead of hunting down other cat pets over time. I can't say if it's the most efficient way to get elephant hide, but I'm including it here as another option for smaller clans and solos. The volcano is the only efficient source of gold in the exile land, so there's no trick to it. Use a pick and clear as much obsidian as you can. You can technically gather gold from chests underwater or inside the Dagon dungeon, but it's not a good source of gold. Sitta has its own unique gold nose that looks something like this. There are areas where they are more common and I'll show them here, but these are scattered just about everywhere like most of the other resources on Sitta, so just keep your eyes peeled. The absolute best way to farm alchemical base is by killing barrier thralls. Their resource packs frequently contain alchemical base, and when they do, it's typically in large quantities. If you don't mind killing named thralls, they can drop over a thousand alchemical base each. The Den and the Black Galleon are the best places to farm bearers, since they're relatively easy to kill, and each one has three to four bearer spawns that respawn every 15 minutes. There's also quite a few bear spawns in some of the smaller camps around the map, so it's often worthwhile to deviate from your usual farm routes to kill them while you're in the area. You can absolutely craft your alchemical base in Sipta though, since gold is much easier to get in larger quantities and bearer thralls are harder to come by. That said, there are going to be a number of guaranteed bearer spawns throughout the map, and the various chests both inside and outside the vaults have a chance to give you the supply crates you need to get alchemical base. So check all the chests you see and mark on the map where you find bearer thralls. Don't waste your time crafting these. Both Exile Lands and the Isle of Sipta have a merchant that will sell you flasks for silver coins. At that exchange rate, a reasonable amount of silver bars will translate into vaults filled with flasks. After a single trip, you're never gonna have to worry about it again. For buff fish, firstly you have to unlock the improved fish trap from here. 
If you're on Sipta, you have a chance to get this recipe from the end chest and vault. The specialty fish that you catch with these traps, when eaten, will give you a full spread of buffed stats. Fishing is a bit of a pain after the trap change, so if you're having trouble getting scales or you don't have access to a safe water source, you just can't be bothered to actively feed grubs into the trap, you can use traditional buffs. One Crimson Lotus Powder, an Elixir of Grace, one Golden Lotus Potion, one Purple Lotus Potion, and an Elixir of Numbing are your standard buffs. This combination of buffs is going to leave you tipsy, but not drunk, and that's the key. In order to farm these and crystals, you're going to need to learn how to crouch swing. Begin the swing animation and then hit crouch. You'll complete the swing animation while crouching, and this is going to help you hit those lower, harder to hit resources. In the Exile Lands, my favorite spot to get puffballs is at K7. This patch is on a hill, which makes hitting them a lot easier. In Sipta, puffballs are only found at the lower left corner of the map, on the southwest island, and along the nearby river. Head over to the Priest King's Retreat whenever possible and harvest him with a pick. He'll drop infused wraps along with some demon blood. This is your bread and butter in the current heal meta. You'll find it spread out in these areas in the Exile Lands. The most concentrated vein of it is over here though, and this is the spot that I would recommend farming. In Sitta, aloe is just about everywhere along every fresh water source, so just follow the rivers and you'll find it. I wouldn't advise using the jungle cave to farm because the density is really lacking, but any of these crystal caves are worth farming. Bearer thralls also have a chance to drop crystals as part of their supply crate, so that's even more reason to be killing them whenever you're out and about. Sipta gives you a lot more options though. You've got more obvious outcrops like these outside some of the dungeons, but pay attention to the ground as well. Those little polished black rocks outside nearly every dungeon and in the center of the map are actually crystals and you can mine them. You'll find them outside almost every single dungeon and they're all over the center of the map.
High efficiency hide farming relies on farming enemies whose hides are stretched into thick hide. To illustrate the point, if you get 60 hyena pelts and 60 bear pelts by killing one of each creature, the bear pelts will stretch in a 90 thick hide giving you 90 tar per kill versus the 60 from a hyena. The difference used to be more pronounced than that, but because there's no upgraded version of the tanner's table currently, these are your best conversion rates. So because of this, prioritize areas that have enemies that you can easily kill that preferably drop hides that can stretch into thick hides. Both of the savanna areas have rhinos and elephants that are great for this. Mammoths and bears can be found in great densities in the north as well. The best area by volume to farm hides is inside the Midnight Grove. Typically I'll run through the hyena section, run through the bear section, then loop back through the panther section. If the hyenas haven't respawned by then, I'll kill some of the humans next to the panther route for human flesh, or even some god favor for antidote potions, or start killing the wolves even. Because you can farm this area in a way that allows it to respawn as soon as you're finished farming, you can farm it non-stop, so you don't have to leave until you've reached tens of thousands of hides potentially. Because of this, if this spot isn't being used, absolutely start here and only use other farming spots if this one is unsafe. As an added benefit, you can't ride horses in this dungeon, which means that nobody's going to ride up on you and lance you while you're in the middle of farming. As with mostly everything in Sipta, once again the resources are fairly spread out. You've got dense pockets of bears in these regions, and the center of the map is covered with rhinos, buffaloes, and elephants that are all great sources of hide. It's risky of course to farm in the center, but that's your best location for tar per hour. I'd say the dungeons are alright as secondary choices, but they've buffed the enemies inside for 2.3, so farm them at your own risk. I'm not really worried about their danger so much as I'm worried about their efficiency. Vault enemies are going to take a lot more time to kill now, so I wouldn't farm them as a primary hide source unless you really had to. You have four primary sources of brimstone in the exile lands. Brimstone Lake and the three Brimstone Caves closer to the center of the map. There is technically Brimstone under the water in the jungle, but it's not an efficient source of Brimstone. Sipta has Brimstone outside nearly every single dungeon as well as densely packed amounts in the center of the map. You can find Brimstone on both the northeast and southwest islands as well as along these sandy portions near the center. The best spot is of course by the center when you can afford to, but they're spread out enough that you should be farming Brimstone whenever you can see it, and it'll add up over time. My favorite spot to farm it is the Black Yeti just outside the volcano because it's easy enough to kill solo even with really budget gear. Maelstrom enemies are your best source of demon blood in Sipta though, some dungeon creatures drop it as well and most of the vault and world bosses will give it when harvested. Most maelstrom creatures now also drop blood sacks which contain even more demon blood inside when opened. In this region specifically in the Redwoods, you get a lot of these corrupted ogres that spawn and they give a ton of demon blood when you harvest them with a pick. The only worthwhile spot to farm Black Ice is in the Amir dungeon. There is technically Black Ice elsewhere like the Warmaker's dungeon, but the density and the volume of Black Ice in the Amir dungeon is unmatched. Farming anywhere else for Black Ice is generally not worth it. Just note that if you don't have really high grade armor, bring spiced food. Holding a torch is also going to give you a small amount of warmth. In Sipta, as usual, check around the vaults and go to the center of the map for your black ice. Just a note on steel, you should always be crafting your steel. In fact, it was always faster to craft your steel, so I'm not really sure why New Asgarth blew up as a source of steel farming. You can farm for thralls here and collect steel along the way, but especially now it's better to farm it. This is because blacksmiths that are tier 3 or higher now all carry the reinforced recipe previously only held by purge blacksmiths. This means that you can turn any iron reinforcement into a steel reinforcement by combining it with steel fire, cutting the iron that you need to farm down by 80% while also considerably reducing crafting times. A complete steel fire farm and a complete iron farm combined will give you thousands and thousands of steel reinforcements and it would take you days to reach the same quantities by farming thralls for it. If you're newer to the game, just understand that once you've turned an iron reinforcement into a steel reinforcement, you can turn that reinforcement into a steel bar. So whether it's steel, hardened steel, or steel reinforcements, crafting steel first is the best way to obtain it in bulk. We'll wrap up our resources with blood. 
It's a minor resource, but you're going to need it for bestial memory potions, potions of midnight, and some cooking recipes. The absolute best source of it is to put human flesh in a fluid press. If you need blood in a pinch, you can even kill yourself and harvest your own body every so often. So now we can move on to specific farming techniques, and a lot of these are going to be fairly minor improvements, but they add up over time. For your basic stuff, pay attention to the duration of the swing animation when farming. Nodes that are normally too far apart to be mined simultaneously by normal swings can actually be mined at the same time if you move during the animation. You can carry the swing between the two nodes. It's not huge, but when you're using oils, it helps you save on durability. In that same vein, body stacking lets you prolong the life of skinning knife oils by luring enemies onto a single spot before you kill them so you can harvest them all at once. I'm going to sound like a broken record, but when you're using oils, you literally measure your effectiveness by the individual seconds that you waste. So small optimizations like this actually double or even triple the effective use time for your oils. This is another basic farming technique that people don't tend to use effectively, and we're going to cover specific use in the route planning, but this is how it works. Essentially, you set up a farming shack next to a resource that you can't otherwise farm efficiently, or a resource that you would want to farm off cooldown. It's just a simple structure with enough gear for you to farm with, repair kits to maintain your tools, and a bed or a bedroll to spawn at. Farm shacks are criminally misunderstood though. Even if you're watching this and you think you know what I'm talking about, bear with me while I overexplain the issue. In order to fully understand efficiency, you have to break down your yields over time. Let's say your trip to God's Claw Passage looks like this. And just to make the math easy, let's say it takes you an hour to gear up. Go to God's Claw, fully mine it, and then return home. Now let's compare it with these iron patches. The volume is a lot lower than God's Claw, but the density is actually really good. What's holding it back is the travel time. It's not located nearly as close to any of its nearest obelisks, so if you were to farm God's Claw for an hour, and if you were to farm this place for an hour, including travel time, this spot would fall behind. The farm shack, by comparison, outside of the initial travel to get over there and build it, essentially has no travel time, and repeated uses of the shack will reduce the effective cost of that initial travel further and further as it approaches zero. You can even reduce the time it takes to gear up by bringing a single set of gear, so unlike your main base, you won't have to filter through multiple boxes to get your setup. You just press F after you spawn and go farm. What this means is that every single moment you spend farming iron like this is spent farming at your highest possible efficiency, so over a longer period of time or even just taking a simple average, locations with moderate density or volume can be made to outperform better locations by controlling for efficiency. For a better example, look at the rhinos in the savanna on the western edge of the map. There's not as many creatures here as in the Midnight Grove. Does that mean that the Midnight Grove is better? Strictly speaking, the answer is actually no. You'll get fewer hides per trip, but the travel time is effectively zero with a farming shack. So in the long run, you're spending less time farming here, but every moment you spend farming here is at an equally high rate of efficiency. So if you were to farm the Grove for an hour, and then compare all the time farming rhinos until you had a full hour's worth of farm, they'd both be incredibly high performing farm areas even though the rhinos have less density, less volume, and aren't located near enough to an obelisk to be traditionally efficient. Let's try applying this to a bomb route, just to illustrate the point. First, start at the Brimstone Lake, clear it, use a map room to go to the dregs and farm the Cavern of Fiends for crystal. Go over the back of the ridge there, because there's a bear respawn point for easy alchemical base. Really, you should be carrying all of your tools anyways, just so you can grab any relevant resources along the way. There's a couple of great super nodes on this route that you can slap for stone, with no loss in time. Or you could even make a detour for some bark. After that, you've got two choices you can take. You can head up to the Warren of Degenerates for more crystal before continuing, grabbing the bear respawn at Flesh Terror Falls and possibly even Demon Blood from the Shaleback Cave. Or you can run straight to the next Brimstone Cave and save some time. Both options have a lot of dead travel time though, so let's see if we can free up some time. Set up a farm shack at your hide source of choice, and let's just use rhinos to illustrate the point. Once you've cleared it, use a map room to warp to the Brimstone Lake. Clear that, and then use a map room to warp down to the dregs and go back to the Crystal Cave. The only considerable stretch of travel time here is the run from the dregs to the Crystal Cave, which means it's fantastic for efficiency. Once you've dropped your goods there, you can use another farm shack at your demon blood source of choice, and in no time at all you've got a reasonable haul of hide, demon blood, crystal, and brimstone, all at peak efficiency. You likely wouldn't get enough hide from just the rhinos, so maybe once you're finished at your demon blood source of choice, you can go back home, gear up, and hit the midnight grove while you wait for your farm route to respawn. Or even more advanced, you can keep a fridge with midnight potions at your drop site so you can warp straight to the grove after the first run. If you don't want to run back to the rhino spawn because it can be inefficient, you can leave a couple of farm sets there instead, so you can just keep spawning there and using it until you run out. Regardless of which option you take, you're still eliminating easily a half hour or more of travel time by using the bedroll. Hopefully you get the idea by now. We're aiming for efficiency and we're using the farming shacks to reduce our travel time so we can hit as many resources as possible in the smallest amount of time. So when you approach farming, I encourage you to think outside the box. 
Seriously consider your farming routes. Ask yourself when you farm what you could have done faster to save time. Every second counts. A SIPTA gives you six spawn locations. You've got your bed, your bedroll, and all four corners of the map, so I'll leave it to you to find creative ways to use that to your advantage. 